Hey, what's up everybody? This is Aaron from Aaron's Audio Corner and today we're going to be reviewing or going over I believe objectively speaking that this is the best passive speaker. I know it's the best passive speaker that I've measured, but it's if it's not the best, it's one of the best passive speakers that is available today per the Sean Olive preference score. Now, before I say too much more about it, I do want to say that while I do put some stock into the preference score, I don't put all of my eggs in that basket, but it's a really good indicator of a design that has great linearity on and off axis. And then we dive into the other aspects about, you know, how loud will it go? Because some speakers will score high on the preference score, but they're just not made to go loud. And this speaker, I think, probably checks all of the boxes better than any passive speaker that I've measured, certainly any passive bookshelf speaker that I've measured. And I believe any passive bookshelf speaker that's been measured by anybody other than myself or myself included. So with that said, let's go ahead and look at this design. We'll talk about some of the objective specs. I'll talk about a little bit about what I heard, and then we'll be on our way. The March Audio Soentuva, I'm not necessarily sure how it's pronounced, but that's how I'm going to pronounce it for the time being, is a two-way design. It's a bookshelf speaker. It features the Satori Beryllium Tweeter in a nice waveguide. This can be purchased separately. Mattisound has it for about $500 per tweeter right now. It also comes with the Purify OEM Midwoofer, as well as two Purify passive radiators on the back. Retail price for this is about $4,000 per pair. These are made in Australia. I'll also say that out of all the speakers that I've tested, this one has the most attention paid to it when it comes to vibration and damping. The inside of the speaker, which unfortunately I just don't have any pictures of at the moment, um, filled with like a fiber fill type material that most of us are, you know, aware of the batting type material, not the polyfill, but it's actually batted, you know, kind of, I don't know, you know, like a thickness of maybe one inch or so, give or take. So it's filled inside with that, but then the the layers on the on the inside of the cabinet are like a CLD constrained layer damping type material. It's butamin, butamin, not necessarily sure how it's pronounced, but Think of the car audio type stuff that you've used or you've seen where it's supposed to help dampen the vibrations. Well, this has some of that type material. It's not the exact same thing, but it's that type of material inside, which really helps to lessen the vibration. And then it also has a dowel rod in between for bracing. So when I say that this speaker does the dang thing as far as attention paid to the vibration control, I mean it. This really and truly is the best speaker I've seen in that regard. Passive, active, floor standard, book standard, whatever. I was truly impressed by the actual build quality of the speaker. Now, as you can see, the look of it is kind of like an unfinished wood, and there's more information on March Audio's website. I implore you to go take a look at it if you're curious about it. They come in a few different finishes. Uh, the one I was sent to me looks kind of cool, but if I'm being honest, it's not necessarily my style. I prefer either like a standard paint scheme or maybe just even a flat black. That's just my personal preference, but go check out their site. I think they also do offer custom finishes as well. So 4,000 bucks for the pair. What does it get you? Well, I already told you that it's one of the best, if not the best passive bookshelf speakers out there, according to just objective data. But what else does it get you? Well, it gets you good output and it gets you reasonably low base, you're still going to want a subwoofer. And I'm going to show you why I say that. But before I go into the data, I will just briefly say subjectively up front that I think this is a fantastic speaker. It's another one of those speakers like the Genelec that's actually sitting over my shoulder, which you can't see probably, uh, 8331A that I reviewed about a week ago. And, you know, at some point, these speakers start to become so good that you really can't, you can't really pick them apart. You know, it's it's easy with Lesser speakers, when you hear something you don't like, you can immediately identify it. Hey, 800 hertz sounds hot, or 8 kilohertz is too hot. There's a resonance of 200 hertz. 
those kind of things are pretty easy to identify pretty quickly when they're there. But when they're not there, you're left with, I really like the speaker. And that's really where I'm at with it. So let's go into the data. I'll talk a little bit more in detail about some of my subjective relations with it. And then we'll be on our way. To start it off, the CEA 2034 data measurement set. If you look at this, you're looking at this and thinking, wow, that's really dang good. But you're probably going to say, what's up with this high frequency lift? Well, that is intended by the manufacturer to be there. So it was not an oversight on their part. And looking at just this data, I would, I would agree with you. You're probably thinking, well, that's, that doesn't seem like the right choice to make. But when you look at the estimated in-room response, then it starts to make a little bit more sense because remember what you're hearing is not just on-axis sound, but a culmination of the on-axis and the reflected sound. The listening window, the early reflections, and the sound power all look great. In fact, I think that this sound power is probably the best I've measured. I, and that's actually the thing that stood out to me when I saw this data. I was just like, that's really good. And it, it kind of almost doesn't even make sense because I would expect the sound power to drop a lot more. But the waveguide in this speaker does a really good job of controlling that directivity and keeping it in line. If we go down here and look at the early reflections directivity index, you're going to see a bump right around the crossover region. And that would stand out to most people when you think, well, okay, that's going to be problematic. But remember that this is going to be due to the vertical separation of the tweeter and the midwoofer below it. But if you look at just the horizontal response, you see that there's no indication of this being there. This is just due to the vertical separation and it's much less problematic. You may also be thinking, wow, look at that sensitivity. That's really low. 100% agree with you. Generally speaking, I don't like speakers that have lower than 85 dB. And, and generally speaking, I like a speaker that has closer to like 87, 88 dB sensitivity. Higher the better, generally for me. But there's always that trade-off about sensitivity versus low frequency output. Again, generally speaking, when you see low sensitivity, you're thinking it's not going to be able to get loud. Well, that's not a problem at all with this speaker. And in turning a low sensitivity up, when you say it's not able to get loud, that's because of distortion and compression. Those artifacts creep up and limit the overall output volume that you're able to listen to. But with the Purify woofer and the Satori used here, they're such low distortion drivers, you don't really have that problem here. So your only enemy really is just the mechanical throw of these woofers. And you can see too that the speaker gets down to about, what is this, 40 hertz or so. I think the F3 is somewhere in the 50 hertz region. It may be a little bit lower than that. Um, I actually don't have that spec with me right now to recall from memory, but it will be on my website if you wanna go check it out there. Bottom line is for most people in a room, you're gonna be okay. You're gonna be able to get down to, I would say at least 50 hertz, maybe even 40 hertz. So it covers the, the basic range of most music, but if you want really low output, yeah, you're definitely going to need a subwoofer. But again, this is a bookshelf speaker, so it really kind of goes without saying. I don't think I've seen many bookshelf speakers that don't require a uh, subwoofer unless it's a powered DSP controlled monitor type speaker, which I've reviewed plenty of those and I'm about to have you another one soon. All of my listening was done about three meters away. I was using the Parasound Hint 6, which is somewhere around 220 watts at 4 ohm, I think. And I say 4 ohm because the average is closer to that 4 ohm region with a minimum impedance of about 3.8 ohm. Now, some people, again, myself included, might look at this data and think, okay, it's got low sensitivity and low impedance. You're going to need a lot of amplifier for it. Yeah, you are going to need a lot of amplifier for it if you want to get pretty darn loud. And you might also say, well, if you want to get pretty darn loud, this speaker's probably not going to do it because, again, it's low sensitivity, which I just covered. That's not a problem with the speaker, and we'll find out why a little bit more later. But you will need an external amplifier for the speaker. You know, some AVRs might be able to power it, but I'm willing to bet that if you're buying the speaker, you're not necessarily wanting to power it with an AVR anyway. The estimated in-room response is pretty dang clean. Now, I've drawn this kind of imaginary line through here to give you an idea of what the tonal balance of the speaker might be. And of course, you can play around with where this line is if you wanted to. You could bring it down, and you could say the treble is going to be risen up above that because these things are all relative. Generally speaking, I would say that the speaker might sound a little bit edgy to some people. Uh, I didn't have that impression at all. None whatsoever, to be quite honest with you. Now, I have tested another speaker that exhibited a similar 
uh, bump in the treble, but the bump was about 3 dB. It was the was it Polk R100, and that speaker was... Mm, I just did not like that speaker. But with this particular speaker, I didn't notice any kind of issue with the treble rise. Now let's take a look at the horizontal performance. Earlier I talked about the early reflections directivity having a bit of a bump around that crossover region, and I said that was due to the vertical response being a little bit mismatched there. Yeah, we can see in the horizontal response, there's no mismatch at all. So whatever is hitting the saw walls is going to come back to you in the same fashion that whatever came at to you from the direct sound. But it seems the higher frequencies drop off at a little bit of a higher rate than the lower treble frequencies. And this is truly just a subjective take on what I'm seeing at the data. Some people may not see this at all, but it jumped out to me more because of this line right through here. And if you follow this along through here, you know, you would expect it to keep going out through here. But it drops down by about maybe 3 to 5 dB, and I find that kind of interesting. And that's important because when we talk about the horizontal directivity in the room, like this, we can see that the radiation pattern going from 200 hertz to about, what is that, 4.5 kilohertz, is pretty constant. I mean, it's about plus or minus 60 degrees. Obviously, it's a little bit wider in the lower frequencies. But when we get above about 5 kilohertz or so, that's where we start to see it narrow up. And that just means that the sound energy that's spread out into the room is going to be a little bit wider through the mid-range. And in the higher frequencies, it's going to be a little bit tighter. And that comes back into play when we talked about the on-axis response earlier. Remember, the on-axis response was lifted. But what you hear is a culmination of everything. So if the on-axis was lifted and the radiation pattern in the room at the high frequencies was wide open then that means that what you're going to hear is definitely going to be lifted in response, right? But since the higher frequencies are more narrow and more focused, there's less energy being spread out to those walls, less energy bouncing back. So what you're going to hear from the tweeter is more of, in, in terms of relativity, right, is more of the direct sound and less of the room kind of coloring that sound as you go higher in frequency. And I've thrown out a little marker here to kind of show you exactly where I'm talking about. So we can see 200 hertz to about, we'll say five kilohertz. And then five kilohertz, you start focusing up pretty tight. So again, I think that's what led the sound to not be bright in my room because, because if the tweeter had its sound radiation wide above this five kilohertz region, it just came on down through here and stayed red, then yeah, it would sound bright to me. Without a doubt, I know that for sure. Now this is the vertical radiation now remember, this is you out in front of the, the speaker, the zero degree axis, which is the tweeter in this case, and then anything below it, and then anything above it goes up this way. So we see a hole in the response at around two kilohertz, and that is a directivity mismatch between the midwoofer and the tweeter. With a design like this, where the waveguide is so large, because it's about seven or so inches in diameter, give or take, um, and then you had that center to center space in between the tweeter to the center of the woofer. That's again, that's roughly about seven inches. It's gonna be hard to control that directivity through that region without using some very steep crossover slopes um, or even you know DSP or and or a really, really low crossover that would put this tweeter into a place where it does not need to be. So I think that this is a perfectly, at least in my opinion, a perfectly um, good trade-off in order to get the horizontal dispersion that they got. Now let's talk output capability. This speaker at 96 dB does not reach the 3% THD distortion threshold until about 60 Hertz or so. At 96 dB at one meter for one speaker, that's pretty darn good, especially for a speaker of its size. And especially considering how relatively low the sensitivity is. I mean, the sensitivity averages, I think it's like 83, I can't remember the exact number, but it's somewhere in that area and it's and in my opinion, that's quite, quite low. But you can see that as long as you have the power, this speaker doesn't have a problem playing loud. And if we go to the compression, it's the same story. The speaker plays well within its limits until 50 hertz. And then 50 hertz at 102 dB, uh, which 102 dB for one speaker is roughly 92 to 94 dB at four meters for a stereo pair in a room. That's pretty darn loud. So. I'm really impressed with the overall output of the speaker for its size. And that's it for this review. Like I said, kind of wanted to hit the highlights. One of the best, if not the best, passive speaker, certainly bookshelf passive speaker, 
that I have measured to date as of this video. And I mean, it's just a beast. I, I think it's one of the best speakers that I've heard for sure, passive wise. Now, certainly I've heard some other awesome speakers and recency bias can certainly play into that. So take that for what it's worth. But that's why we had the data to help us understand, is this a good speaker or is this not a good speaker? And the data certainly indicates that it is a great, excellent speaker. I was able to push the speaker to about 100, I think 100 dB at three meters in my room uh, before the the midwoofer started to, or the passive radiator or the midwoofer, I'm not sure which one, started to identify itself. Which 100 dB at three meters is pretty dang loud, I would say. I mean, nobody's going to be listening to it that loud. Which means that at standard listening levels, you have plenty of dynamic range to play the speaker. Of course, that's what the compression data also shows us as well. And with that, I'm out. I do appreciate you watching the review. If you haven't already, please hit the thumbs up, like, subscribe, all that neat stuff. If you want to support the channel, uh, you can do so a few different ways. I'll throw a generic Amazon affiliate link, which means that if you need to buy some new underwear for yourself or you want to buy some speaker wire, whatever, any of that proceeds, you get like 4% will go to me to help this channel stay afloat. Uh, you can also go through my Patreon, www.patreon slash Aaron's Audio Corner, and you can sign up there. I have a few different tiers if you want to support monthly. That would be really cool and much appreciated. And I will talk to you all later. I hope you enjoyed it and I hope you learned something. If you have any questions, please ask. That's it. Take care. Peace.